Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, seminar in the uh, Distinguished Series in Optimization and Data Seminar Series, which is sponsored by IFDS, Institute for Foundations of Data Science, PIMS, and the Departments of Math, Applied Math, Statistics, ECE, and CSE. So thanks to the sponsors. Today we are very happy to have uh, UW alumni from the Mathematics Department, Tin Kei Pong. So Tin Kei is an associate professor in Hong Kong Polytechnic University in the, math, in the Applied Math Department. And so he got his master's degree in uh, 2006 from Chinese University of Hong Kong. He got a PhD in math from our own uh, UW Math Department in 2014. Um, and then did some postdocs at Simon Fraser University, at University of Waterloo, and at University of British Columbia, then joined the Hong Kong PolyU in 2014. So we're very happy to have Tin Kei come here. He's in town for the optimization conference that just finished, and we look forward to hearing even more about his uh, recent research. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks also the organizer for granting me a chance to share my research work here. Uh, yeah, thanks, Miriam, in particular. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about something maybe a little bit more theoretical, uh, error bounds for conic visibility problems, uh, and I will show some case studies on the exponential cone, okay, which might sound a little bit weird object. So this is a joint work with uh, Scott Lindstrom, who is currently in Curtin University in Australia, and uh, also Bruno Lorenzo, who is currently in the Institute of Statistical Mathematics in Tokyo. Yeah. Okay. So let me start with some ah, motivation. So our really, really, really background motivation comes from conic programming problems. Okay, now this is the object that I am looking at. So we try to minimize something like a linear objective subject to, again, something linear. And not only that, I also require my x to lie in a closed convex cone. Now this thing is really just the inner product for the Euclidean space. Okay. And here for simplicity, I also assume that b, the right hand side, is already in the range of a, so that, well, when you look at just the linear system, it is already consistent. Now this problem might look quite innocuous at first glance. Right? We are minimizing something linear, subject to something linear, so how hard can it be? Well, we have a closed convex cone here, and there are a lot of weird things that can happen right, when you play around with this k. So some examples, um, which might be very familiar, uh, hopefully. <laughs> so non-negative orthant. Well, when you have the non-negative orthant as your k, you will be minimizing linear, subject to linear constraint and sign constraint. So that will be linear programming problems. And you can solve using simplex method. And if you like, you can do interior point method if the size is not too large. Okay. Well studied, but still ongoing. Well, the second common choice would be the PSD cone, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. And this would give you SDPs. And again, you can call CVX and call the uh, respective interior point solver to solve the corresponding semi-definite programming problems. Another common choice of cones would be second order cones, also known as ice cream cone. Uh, in three dimension, these are just objects like this. Okay. Or product of second order cones. Well, in this case, you will get some second order cone programming problems, and they can be transformed as SDP, and you can call SDP solvers, et cetera, and et cetera. So a lot of work on these cones already. Now today, ooh, we're going to look at a weird object called exponential cone. Well, this is a closed convex cone. It might, look, it might not look like a closed convex stuff at first glance, well, because I, I have chosen a bad definition. Okay, it is the union of two pieces. Now, if you look at the second piece, this is actually a polyhedron. Okay, it's a polyhedron. Well, the second piece actually comes from taking the closure of the first piece. So that's, that explains why this is not really two, connected, uh, two disconnected pieces. Okay. Now, in the first part is the epigraph of the so-called perspective function of the exponential function. 
Now what it means is that, well, basically you start with the so-called epigraph of the exponential function. Let's say you consider all those x1 and x3 such that x3 is greater than equal to e to the x1. So everything that lies about the exponential function. And then, well, somehow we introduce an extra x2, which would be a positive number. And then you multiply it through, scaled it. Now, looks abstract. But remember, there are two pieces. So now I show you a picture. So here shows a, well, basically two pieces. <laughs> uh, the purple thing, the vertical purple thing, is the second piece that appears in the definition of the exponential cone. Now the blue curved surface is the lower boundary of the first part in the definition of the exponential cone. Okay. So the exponential cone itself is actually everything that is bounded between these two surfaces. Okay. And well, we'll get to a little bit later, but this cone looks quite normal if you view it like this. Well, it's not very normal, it's not very uniform. Some part of it is flat, the other part of it is smooth. Um, when it gets to here, that's all the thing that brings you trouble, okay? So it actually gets very close to the xy plane if you view it from this part, okay? When it gets close to the so-called negative red axis, okay, to see the arrow direction, this would be the positive red axis, and then this is the negative part, okay? So there will be a lot of weird things going on when you view it from this side. We'll get back to this picture later. Okay. So this cone has been recently added to MOSAC and other conic solvers. And it has applications in relative entropy optimization. So Wankart, well, not very recent work already, 2017. And besides the exponential cone, well, of course, you can also consider product cones of all the cones above. Okay. Now, for those who are more familiar with non-negative orphans, PSD cone and second order cones, an obvious question might be, why do we want to go beyond those three comfortable cones? Okay. We have nice solvers already. Well, so why those exotic cones? <laughs> Coming from nowhere, it seems, right? Well, the first obvious answer would be, it will definitely provide richer modeling power for our conic solvers. So for example, um, if you want to model something like this, well, this function is called, well, log sum exponential. Yeah, not a very creative name. You just read it from the left to the right, okay? <laughs> but on the other hand, you can, if you multiply this, uh, if you multiply a mu here and divide a mu here, this gadget typically is called softmax, okay? A more fancy name, okay? As mu goes to zero, it, you actually get the maximum of all the xi's. Anyways, if you want to model more, uh, level sets of these kind of functions, find all those x and t that satisfy this inequality on the left, it is really equivalent to say that there exists a z vector or a z vector satisfying this affine relationship. And these triples, these triples lie in the exponential cone. So that becomes some exponential cone feasibility problem. And there's a cone-like modeling cheat sheet by Mosec. Uh, I'm not doing co Mosec commercial. I'm not receiving money from them. Okay, but this is a nice summary of all the stuff that with the addition of exponential cone and also something called power cone, which unfortunately I won't have time to get to today. Um, you can model stuff that you really want to get to, like entropy function, um, well, geometric mean function, and, other, and many other functions that you want to get to, but you, may not, you would not be able to do it uh, with the classical non-negative orphans, uh, semi-definite cone, and et cetera. Okay. An exponential cone is one of the key cones. Of course, another question would be, why these specific cones, right? There are many other functions of choice that you can try to make a cone. Well, um, I'm not an expert on this particular topic, Okay, but these and many other exotic cones, they have nice logarithmically homogeneous self-concordance barrier functions. I'm just reading from the slides. And this allows, 
relatively direct adaptation of many existing interior point method routines. So that's why those solvers love this. Okay, they can directly apply their routine and gain richer modeling power. Okay, so this is like introduction to why we need those exotic cones. Okay. Now, this is the real part. Okay, so our focus is actually conic feasibility problem, which uh, you can view this as a special case of conic um, optimization problem, but uh, more or less they are actually equivalent to each other. So uh, the problem of today is we would like to find an x that lies in the intersection of a closed convex cone and an affine set. And throughout this whole talk, I will just represent the affine set as a shift vector plus a subspace. Okay. So that's my affine set. Now for simplicity, I will be focusing on the case that somehow, by some other means, you know that the affine set, well, you know that the intersection is already non-empty by some dual condition or whatever. And we just want to find something in the intersection. Okay. Now this non-emptiness setting actually arises naturally from optimality conditions of conic programs. So I'll just briefly go through it, although yeah, I think Kotlin would be laughing. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, suppose you consider the conic programming problem. Like that's why I start with the conic programs. Um, now, let's say, assume that the solution set S is non-empty, and let's say we denote, and somehow we know the optimal value to be B. Well, we can also derive a formulation that does not depend on the optimal value, um, but uh, that would require, well, basically, we would look, need to look at primal dual KKT conditions. But so for simplicity, let's say somehow we know the optimal value. Then, well, the solution set can be conveniently represented like this. Because by being an optimal solution, it just means that first of all, um, I have to be feasible. That means I have to be in AX equals B and I have to be in K. And my objective value has to equal to the optimal value. So if you put this linear constraint and also this objective value equals V as an affine set, then the intersection with the cone would just give the optimal solution. Okay. So finding a solution is really solving the corresponding conic feasibility problem, finding an element in the intersection of K and the affine set. And okay, uh, I want to emphasize that in this case, if our feasibility problem actually arises like this from optimization problems, typically, I just say typically, although the, inter okay. although the intersection is non-empty, when we consider the intersection with the interior or the relative interior of the cone, typically this is empty, typically. Okay. Otherwise, you might be able to perturb this constraint a little bit to improve the function, to improve the objective value, and then that will lead to contradiction. Okay. So typically, this would be empty. Now, here comes the key question <laughs> we consider in this talk uh, okay, about this conic feasibility problem. So if I give you an x, okay, so uh, when can I say that a feasibility problem is approximately solved? When, I, when can I say that I have found an element more or less inside the intersection? Well, obvious answer computer distance. True, but if you need to compute a distance, distance is the norm of x minus the projection. So that technically means that you know how to compute a projection, but if you know how to compute a projection, you are already in the set, then there's no approximately solved issue. So, so typically, computing the projection onto the intersection is hard. But on the other hand, if you, try to, if you just try to compute a projection onto the two constituent sets, like the affine set, well, you have a closed form formula for that. Yeah, you have a closed form formula pro for projection onto affine set. And, well, for the distance to the cone, hmm, 
if we are looking at the non-negative orthons or the PSD cone, we have closed form formula for the distance. Even for the exponential cone, uh, we can rely on MOSEC. They have a nice numerical routine, as at least they advertise that. So these things would be much easier to compute, relatively easier to compute. But now, can we declare that we have a good solution if this gadget is small? Sounds like a stupid question to ask, but it's not very obvious if you think about it. Well, first of all, this gadget is zero if and only if this gadget is zero. That is true. But we only know that this gadget is greater than or equal to this gadget. Typically, not the other way around. Okay, because the set upstairs is smaller. And indeed, it could happen that when this one is in the order of 10 to the minus 16, even, this one may only be in the order of 10 to the minus 1. So what matters is really try to compute the order of magnitudes of these two gadgets. So that we can hope that by making this thing small, then this one might be small. Okay, then we can say something. Oh, this shows up again. Okay. So typically, the intersection with the relative interior is empty. Okay. okay. Now, to make sense of order of magnitude, typically, ah, I'm saying typically too much. Okay. So usually, we make use of error bounds. Okay. Now, we have a lot of error bound notions in the literature, so uh, I will make it explicit here. So uh, this is what I mean by error bound. So let theta be between 0 and 1, okay, uh, excluding 0, including 1. Now we say that the feasibility problem satisfies a uniform Hodarian error bound with the given exponent if for every bounded set, so we, rep we do this for every bounded set, fix any bounded set, we can find a number so that this quantity that we cannot compute would be bounded by this quantity that we can compute to a certain power. Well, the power is actually theta. And this constant would depend on the bounded set. And this inequality holds for all x. And when theta equals 1, we will say that Lipschitz error bound holds. Hello. Well, this error bound is known to be uniform because the theta here does not depend on the bounded set. Okay. Now, for this talk, and actually for my whole recent line of work, well, of course, I'm interested in establishing conditions for this error bound to hold, but I have been lazy in the sense that, for now, I don't really <laughs> try to compute a constant in front of it because it looks hard. So what I will be interested in is mainly a big O relationship. So this would, whether given a bounded set, whether I can write a big O relationship like this. So the left-hand side equals the big O of the right-hand side. Does this look a little bit more user-friendly? <laughs> okay, and so in this case, the theta would be the headline here, whether, you can, whether we can come up with a suitable exponent so that we can compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side in a big, in a big O manner. Hey. Examples. For polyhedron, which will correspond to linear programming problems, Lipschitz error bound holds. So basically, the left hand side and the right hand side, they are really sort of in the same order of magnitude. Okay, that's why linear, programming are, linear programs are nice. Now, for this condition, which I repeatedly emphasize that it would fail. <laughs> In general, for cognitive program for uh, cognitive feasibility problems that arise from cognitive programs, Lipschitz error bound holds. This is a result dating back to well at least 1996 by Heinz Bowski and John Bowen. Beyond polyhedrality and beyond this condition, uh, actually we don't know much. So we know that for PSD Kong by the seminal work in 2000 by Sturm, 
the Hodarian Erebon actually holds with a very peculiar, interesting, weird exponent. So first of all, there's a two here, and then there's a power to the minus L minus one. A very interesting little L. And this L has to do with facial reduction. Again, another classical concept dating back to 1981 by John Bowen and Henry Wolkowicz. So, uh, in the next couple of slides, three slides to be more precise, and maybe 10 minutes or 12 minutes, I will actually walk through the derivation of this weird exponent. Okay. Hopefully, I can show you the key ingredients from our perspective for deriving error bounds. And then we will extend that to deal with the more general exponential cone. Well, I won't say exponential is more general, but some other cones. Okay, now to understand facial reduction, first of all, uh, we need to know what's a face. Now this definition is for, for those who actually know what a face is. Okay. <laughs> for those who don't know what a face is, to start with, okay, face is first of all a subcone of the given cone. Okay, and you can you can just simply focus on the second bullet point. Okay, just the second bullet point. Okay, expose the face would be typically all we need in this talk. Now, an exposed face would be a subcone that is obtained by intersecting a closed convex cone with some set perp. Now, what's set perp? Set perp is just all those x such that it is orthogonal to the given vector z. Okay. And the z does not come arbitrarily; it comes from an object called dual cone. Now, what does that mean? Uh, okay, so. Let's not be too uh, unrigorous. <laughs> now, first of all, <laughs> the dual cone is defined like this. Um, you don't need to look at the definition too much, but def definitely it contains the origin. Yeah, this I think you can check, right? Now, if z is just this zero, zero perp is the whole space. Yeah, every vector is orthogonal to zero. Okay. Now, then in that case. K intersects zero perp is just K. So that means hmm, any cone is an exposed face of itself. Yeah, it's ex exposed by the zero vector. Other than that, other than the zero vector, okay, typically, well, yeah, uh, my hand is waving a lot. So <laughs> yeah, there, are, uh, there are also some uh, degenerate cases. But typically, what this, uh, what this thing means being in a dual cone typically means that uh, this set perp, which is the hyperspace generated, um, hyperspace that is orthogonal to Z, does not intersect the interior of K. So, it's, so what, what's happening here is that this thing is just cutting a boundary slice of the cone that you're interested in. Okay. Cut a boundary slice of that. Okay. Just like you take a piece of bread and then cut a, <laughs> cut a, <laughs> cut a slice of the bread off the boundary. Okay, so that's what's happening. Okay. Ooh, even a bigger theorem. There will be a picture in the next slide. So, this is the only assumption here, which is, well, basically what we assume because we have a feasibility problem, we assume that it's feasible. Then, we have the following conclusions. First of all, um, we can generate a chain of faces. Well, these are real faces. They are not necessarily exposed. So, well, we will call the first face K, and then uh, until the last face, we call that F of L. Now, they are proper face. They are proper subset of each other. And more interestingly, the next face is an exposed face is obtained from the previous face by cutting off a boundary slice. So it's a boundary slice of the previous phase. Okay, you see it satisfies all the conditions of an exposed phase. And more importantly, 
The set I is chosen so that it is in here. Well, what does this mean? This means that the whole affine set that we're interested in, this gadget, is contained in set I prep. We do not choose the set I arbitrarily. Okay? So we do not choose our knife arbitrarily when we cut the bread. It has to contain the whole affine set. Now, two more facts. The final phase, together with the affine set, would still preserve the same intersection. And this is the part that we are interested in. Although we may not know anything about the error bound relationship between K and the affine set, we may not know anything. When we get to this final phase, it has Lipschitz error bound. Okay, so we may not know nothing about error bound when we are at here, but when we get down to here, Lipschitz error bound holds. Okay, a lot of symbols. Now this is a picture. Uh, I'm not sure whether this helps. Okay, this is stolen from uh, my co-author, Bruno Lofrancho. Um, okay, so the K here is the cone, it's an inverted thing. And uh, what is my affine set? My affine set is L plus A, that is a line over here, the green line. And the green dot is the intersection, uh, or maybe it's yellow. I don't know, <laughs> okay? This dot is the intersection. Now, when we apply the facial reduction procedure, we have to make sure that we choose a Z so that the Z prep, which is the knife, would contain the whole L plus A and intersect K at the boundary. And I think this one seems to be the only thing that would fit this criterion. Okay, it will contain the green line and it only intersect K at the boundary. And of course, the intersection would be a phase. That's the F. Okay, that is what is happening here. Z prep is containing L plus A and Preserving the intersection, definitely, because F intersect L plus A is also this dot. And my F is just a array, yeah, a half line. So it's polyhedral. L plus A is also polyhedral. So Lipschitz error bound holds by the Hoffman error bound. Okay. So these are the four facts that we need for the facial reduction. Not asleep yet. Yeah, question? How hard is it to find a Z that is? Ah, okay. Um, it is mainly existential because that's what we need in our construction in the proof argument. Yeah. But I think uh, Henry, Henry Walkovics has some algorithm trying to find this Z because he actually. Uh, has algorithm applying facial reduction to try to simplify semi-definite programs. But for general cones, this can be very hard. Yeah. And I only use, need this as an existential result for proving the final error bound. Okay. Thank you. For some problems, you can, you can actually compute them explicitly. Like for some structure problems, like in combinatorial optimization, like the relaxations, the relaxations, you can actually like, build them from like, Okay, so facial reduction is done. Okay, that's the picture that we have in mind in the previous slide. Now, another key ingredient is this so-called key observation. Okay. Now, uh, I'm not sure whether this thing was explicitly stated in Sturm's paper. I never understood Sturm's paper. It's too difficult for me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. He's such a genius, I, <laughs> I cannot really understand that. Um, so actually, I, I came across Bruno's talk a couple of years ago. That's why I uh, started working with him. And he seems to understand everything there. And he actually has ex extended Sturm's result to uh, deal with symmetric cones. And I think uh, this key observation was explicitly stated in his paper. So I cited both. Okay. But I, I'm pretty sure Sturm definitely knows this one. OK. so. What's happening is, for PSD cone, just for the PSD cone, if you start with a phase, now this notation means F is a phase of the PSD cone. Okay. If you start with a phase, start with a Z in F star. Now, if you consider this thing, well, this is really like the next thing that is, the next phase that is going to be generated in the facial reduction procedure, because the next phase is the is a, is a exposed phase of the previous phase. 
So this is really talking about this, the current step and the next step in the facial reduction procedure. And it says you can find a kappa, which can depend on the phase and how you cut it to generate the next phase, such that you have this inequality. Now this epsilon is also a function of x, okay? This, this epsilon is actually the interesting part. This epsilon is a thing that has to do with the distance to the constituent set. So this feels like the error bound that we want, but this is on the phase itself. Okay, um, the key observation is just that this holds. Now, making use of this and the facial reduction procedure, I'm going to show you Sturm's error bound. And then we will more or less uh, try to figure out what are the key ingredients that we need in order to extend the thing to exponential code. Okay. <sighs> okay. So um, for the PSD cone and L plus A. Now, we actually do an induction, but it's not very hard, actually. But I would say this is the most technical part in the talk. Once we get past it, there will be pictures. <laughs> Ooh. OK, so first of all, we fix a bounder set. Well, that's what we need to do. Error bound is for each bounder set, you have a big O relationship. Okay? So fix a bounder set. Now, apply the facial reduction procedure to the affine set and the PSD cone so that you get a chain of phases ah. so that when you get to the last phase, you still preserve the intersection. So this is what happens. And to the last phase, you have Lipschitz error bound. So that's why you have this inequality over here. Okay? So you preserve the intersection and you have Lipschitz error bound. Now what? Okay, my FL, it comes from, it comes as an exposed phase of the previous phase. So this is, this FL is just this. Okay, so I'm just writing down the definition. And I also change the max to the plus. Okay, forget about this part for the moment. Okay, okay so I change the max to plus, and I write down the definition of L, FL, which is, just the previous phase intersects some step perp. That's it. Then, the brown part here is just a key observation. Just plug in. Not doing anything, well, except I changed the name of all the constants. Okay. Just plug in. Okay, now, uh, this expression looks very complicated. Okay. How can we get a big O relationship? Well, big O means you basically uh, just look at those things that, that's dominant, right? So what will be dominant when you are in a bounded set? Well, uh, you can rewrite the epsilon as square root epsilon times square root epsilon. And this is just big O of square root epsilon. Yeah, x is bounded, so <laughs> make it bigger. Okay, just leave one of them. So this means this gadget is bounded by the, the uh, this means this gadget is bounded by the thing downstairs. Okay, well, you have to make this bigger as well. <laughs> but basically, um, the first brown part is, you can just replace it by a square root as an upper bound. Secondly, set perp contains the whole affine set that is in our construction. Okay, we choose the set so that the high supporting hyperspace would contain the whole affine set. And this makes this distance an upper bound of this distance. So we can do another upper bound. So the whole thing with our lovely big O collapses to this. Okay, so square root is a dominant thing and then we have uh, this part will be replaced by the distance to the L plus A. Okay. And now you see the induction, because we just went from FL to L minus 1. And well, with an additional 1 half, which comes from, now this is very important, comes from the dominant part in this epsilon. Okay. Square root epsilon is dominates epsilon, when we write the big O. So we have a square root here. Okay. Now we can just keep going. 
and recall that our k is just f1. So induction will give you this power. Because you keep composing the square root l minus 1 times. OK, so thanks to the big old business, we have Sturm's error bound. <laughs> now, well, you can see that what we are doing here is basically we made use of facial reduction so that we have the phase chain, and we have the key observation. Okay. Now, facial reduction is for general closed convex cone already. So if we want this business to go beyond PSD cone, we need to generalize the key observation to general closed convex cone. Okay. So that's the key. Now, before I move on, let me rename this gadget uh, as kappa s plus square root st, okay? because I don't want my function entry to have epsilon and norm of x, so I just rename them as s and t. <laughs> and so, um, it was the really, so previously it was the dominant exponent of epsilon that matters, now it is the dominant exponent of s that matters. Okay. So I'm just renaming it. So this is uh, the definition that we try to uh, write down. Basically, it starts from uh, it started from Bruno's work, which he defined a facial residual function in a uh, a little bit more restrictive framework where he also required something called amenable cone. Uh, but here we don't need that restriction anymore. So uh, we call uh, beside a one-step facial residual function if somehow me making the key observation which was this one over here with this distance. We also have this distance over here, but um, now we have a, this one is basically the epsilon in the previous slide. So if we can find a psi so that this inequality holds. Now, as an immediate example for PSD cone, uh, it will look like this. That is exactly the function we see in the previous slide. Okay, that's why I rename it as S and T so that you saw it another, for another time. Okay, and this kappa actually would depend, it can depend in general on F and Z. Yeah. Okay. Now, once we know the one step facial residual functions and once we know the phase, phase chain from the facial reduction procedure, then error bound can be derived as in the previous slide by just induction procedure. So we basically go ahead and compose all the dominant power in the one-step facial residual functions for those phases that appeared along uh, the phase chain. So it's an induction procedure. Okay. Now, facial reduction is not something that I'm going to touch. So let's see. Uh, let's look at the one-step facial residual functions then. Now, what kind of one-step facial residual function or for which phase do we need? Um, in the worst case, let's try to compute everything possible in order to get a full description of all possible kind of error bounds, depending on the, uh, what, which affine set you intersect with. Okay. So uh, this is the recipe. So we will go to each non-polyhedral phase. Why don't, why don't we care about polyhedral phase? Well, because once we hit a polyhedral phase, we don't do facial reduction anymore. We get Lipschitz error bound, we stop. So we start with a non-polyhedral phase and try to go to the next step, which is we identify all the exposed phases, and then we compute all the corresponding one-step facial residual functions. Okay, a lot of computations. Yeah, and you will see what. Uh, yeah, you will see what this computation leads to in the slide that I show the reference. Okay. Okay. Now, how does this business work for the exponential cone? Okay, we come back to our lovely exponential cone, or maybe not very lovely. Yeah. Now, um, we need to look at all non-polyhedral phase. Now, what are the, all the non-polyhedral phases? Well, let's start with the largest one, which is the exponential cone itself. The exponential cone itself is an exposed phase of itself, and it's clearly not polyhedral because it has a curved surface. So go to the exponential cone, try to find all the exposed phases first. Okay, um, yeah, this is exponential cone, say hello, yeah, 
OK? Yeah. Now, what are the exposed surfaces of this exponential cone? Hmm. Uh, I would guess you, would, uh, you should agree that the purple thing is an exposed surface because it is obtained by intersecting the exponential cone with the red blue plane. OK, you take the red blue plane, boom, and then you will get the purple plane. That's a purple face, that's the exposed face. Now, what are the other exposed faces? For example, this one. Actually, any rays that lie along this blue curved surface, ooh, it's, oh, it's gone uh, like this. Any rays that lie along the blue curved surface is an exposed face because this is a blue curved surface. There is the unique tangent plane that intersects the exponential cone to give this ray. <laughs> okay, so you always have a unique tangent plane here, and yeah, that's and that's exactly why this ray is exposed. And uh, this uniqueness goes on, 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 on until you get to the negative red axis. Okay, well. The, there's also some problem with the vertical blue axis. The vertical blue axis is actually not exposed. But anyways, the negative red axis is also an exposed surface, but it is a weird one. So let me go back. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, okay. Yes. Now, this negative red axis is weird because there are several ways of getting it. There's no unique tangent plane for, for you to get this particular uh, exposed phase. So for example, you can do the tilter plane. Ooh. And then you get the negative red axis. Okay. Do I, yeah. Do I need to change the color of the plane? Do you see it? Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So it's tilted, right? And on the other hand, you can do the horizontal plane as well. Yeah. But I think you already feel that it looks very different from the previous one, okay? At least, well, although they give the same intersection with the exponential cone, because, well, for example, imagine you are a creature living on this horizontal plane, right? If you walk on this side and then the exponential is just falling on, on top of your head, right? <laughs> you get, it's very narrow here. But if you look at the tilde plane, if you were a creature living on the tilted plane, well, I mean, the exponential cone is quite far. It looks very sharp. It's crashing against your world, but it never just, it never, fall, it never forces on, to, on, your, on top of your head. Okay? It's just sharp. So you should expect the uh, one step facial residual function or whatever error bound would be, would, look, would take a different behavior because um, the one step facial residual function has to do with the distance to the cone, distance to the intersection, and distance to the plane. So, let me delete this. Okay, so let me quickly tell you, quickly summarize. Now, these are the non-trivial exposed phases of the exponential cone. There's also, there are also two trivial phases, which are the exponential cone itself and also the vertex, the origin. And we, just, we have just seen all this. These are the one-dimensional rays along the blue curve of the surface. This is a negative red axis. This is the two-dimensional purple plane that is standing. Okay. Now, they are all polyhedral. They are all polyhedral. Right? So that means if you actually apply the facial reduction procedure, of course, this is a three-dimensional cone. Okay? You apply the facial reduction procedure, and you will stop once you hit a polyhedral phase, because you already get Lipschitz error bound, you're done. So you will actually stop your facial reduction procedure in at most one step. Okay. That means, well, we, we underwent a lot of induction procedure in order to prove the error bound in the PSD cone case, but in here, um, induction stops in one step, so technically you don't need to compose the one-step facial residual function. So what you see as the dominant power in your, your one-step facial residual functions would just appear in the final error bound. Hmm? What about the vertex? Oh, that's interesting. That, that's the interesting thing. Uh, from our procedure, you can see that we, uh, we will never get that phase 
if you just apply it to the exponential cone feasibility problem. But if you consider product cones, yeah, we will need to take, take that into account. Yeah. Yeah, because our procedure stopped in <laughs> one iteration, so you will only get these exposed phases. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just show you the weird one step facial residual functions, and I think that's about time. So, first of all, uh, for those rays along the blue curve of the surface, the dominant power in the S is square root. Now, what this means in the final error bound is, well, in terms of the final error bound, what you will get is big O of square root of whatever. That's the maximum between the distance to the cone and the distance to the L plus A. If, if this one-dimensional phase actually shows up in the facial reduction procedure. Okay. Okay, so if it happens that the set perp you have chosen uh, would in basically intersect the cone to give this uh, one-dimensional ray, then your error bound would look like the red that I have put down. Now, for other cases, it will be similar, but OK. It might be easier if I just erase it. Ooh, OK, good. Yeah. And for the negative red axis, that has two different ways to form it. So it really depends on which hyperspace that arises in the facial reduction procedure, or equivalently, which hyperspace actually contains the affine set that you're interested in, okay, in your feasibility problem. So if you use the tilter plane, this is the tilter plane, the set 2 greater than 0, then the error bound would be Lipschitz. The dominant power is just s, s to the power 1. Now, if you, have, if you use the horizontal plane, you have a crazy error bound. So the dominant power is not even a power. It is in the order of 1 over log s, when s is small. Okay, uh, forget about the park downstairs. We just try to make it look nice and make it continuous and make it go to it, make, make it a function that is defined everywhere. Okay, so that part is not important. So this thing, it is going to zero very slowly as s goes to zero. So you get a very crazy upper bound. It's very large. Now, for the two-dimensional phase, so if you if your if it happens that the set prep you have chosen contains the uh, not contains, um, would actually give the, uh, this unique two-dimensional two phase well, when intersecting with the exponential cone. The final error bound, the dominant part is in S is this thing, which is in the order of minus S log S. Entropy function. Okay, weird. Now this, this, talk, uh, this bullet point talks about the uh, comparison of the rates uh, as s goes to zero for these upper bounds. So this one goes to zero very slowly. This one goes to zero faster than any s to the alpha when alpha is between zero and one strictly, but it's slower than l, uh, slower than s. Okay. And these would have implication on the uh, convergence rate and uh, other stuff when you, for example, uh, try to apply alternating minimization, uh, no, alternating projection kind of method. Okay, last bullet point. Now, you might be saying that I'm just proving upper bounds, right? So I can just make my right-hand side as large as possible. <laughs> I put an infinity there, right? And that, that will always work, right? And, and then you, you, you have been sitting here for 15 minutes, right? <laughs> uh, no. So uh, we, uh, we can actually show that these functions are asymptotically the best in the sense that we have constructed sequences so that you throw to both sides of the inequality, they go to zero in the same order of magnitude. So they are tight in some sense. OK. So uh, yeah, there are also some stuff in this paper. Basically, uh, we have a computational framework to tell you how to compute those facial residual functions. But I guess I don't have time to cover them today. So uh, yeah, so everything I just talked about can be found in this paper, uh, recently published in math programming. And I think the length <laughs> explains why <laughs> The derivation and everything is so messy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for bearing with me for 15 minutes. Okay. Are there any questions?
Questions for Kincaid? Hey. Is there something interesting that happens with products? Yeah, for products, um, we, we do have a, a rule for computing the facial residual function for product cones. And when it comes to product of exponential cones, uh, because we always try to find exposed faces of cones, but when it comes to the, when, when we have product of exponential cones, the exposed phase of exponential cone can contain the non-exposed phase of uh, exponential cone in some component. So in that case, we also need to uh, compute facial residual functions for that particular non-exposed phase. Yeah, and this is actually uh, something a little bit beyond the uh, previous framework constructed by Bruno, which he assumed amenable cones, which are necessarily facially exposed. So that would not cover exponential cones. Perhaps a silly question, but for the um, facial reduction for the STP cone, mm. this is parameter L, is it known very much about like how many iterations it's required before you get this Lipschitz error? Oh, that is a very good question. I think it is typically done by in a case by case manner. I think that that thing has a special name for that, it's singularity degree. Yeah, it's typically done in a case by case. Mana. Maybe, maybe Dima knows more about that. He works a lot on that. Is he that just following what Dima has been doing? <laughs> so in the worst case, for SDP, the singularity degree is as large as the dimension. So in the worst case, might have to go down, play down one dimension every time. So those bounds, like the two to the whatever, that's tight. Uh, but for many examples from like structured problems, uh, they have singularity to do one. Yeah. So in many cases, it actually suffices to this to, uh, to just the one iteration. So you have the, in that case, just hold the air bound the square root. So often is the best of the worst. Say again? So often either the best of the worst. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be. Yeah. Um, like uh, there are these problems having to do with uh, like sensor network localizations and like uh, filling out Euclidean distance matrices and things like this. So that the SDPs that come from that are always um, are always uh, degenerate like this. But the cliques in the graph turn out to like capture all the important degeneracies. So if you use that information, you could most of the time for reasonable graphs just do a single step of facial reduction and get a smaller SDP that's regular. Any last questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Pinky again.